So this morning I heard the Atlanta popular radio host, Portia Fox, call Clarence Thomas an Uncle Tom and refer to other people as Uncle Toms. What I find interesting is that supposedly intelligent people, not just her, but many who sit aloft in high offices, who claim to be educated, who went to these different schools, calling people Uncle Toms, which just really shows that these people don't read, that they lack understanding, and that the masses of people will follow whatever it is that's been put out as truth without ever researching it themselves. These kind of people, you need to leave alone. These kind of people shouldn't be your leaders. These kind of people should not be the ones that you follow. I'm going to break down the true nature of Uncle Tom, Sambo, and tell you guys a personal story to shut down people thinking that I left Christianity because I was hurt by the church. Yo, what's up everybody? How you doing? This is your Coach Renz. And I want to thank all my patrons and everybody for being here. If you are finding me for the first time on this channel, this is my Lorenzo Reed channel. Please hit that subscribe button. And uh, if you really like the channel, go over and be a patron at my Patreon channel, which is Patreon forward slash Coach Renz. Now, oh, and this channel is about hermetics and understanding and lesson and, and education. So, we're going to talk about Uncle Tom and the meaning behind it. As I grew up as a kid, I was always told and always had the understanding that Uncle Tom was a traitor to the black community. That Uncle Trump, Uncle Tom was somebody who went against the betterment of the black community. That if you didn't agree with the majority of the black community and doing things that way, if you protected your oppressors, then you were an Uncle Tom. If you protected your oppressor's property, you were an Uncle Tom. And that's what I believe growing up as a, as a small kid and I was hearing these terms when I was five six seven eight nine years old but what strange thing that occurred in my life right around the age of eight nine during that summer before I turned nine um, is the fact that I was one of the better baseball players in Marietta Georgia at that time frame I had only struck out three times in my entire baseball life by the time I was nine. I didn't even have my first strikeout until I was 11 or 12. But in my entire baseball life before my eyes went so bad and my family couldn't afford glasses, I only struck out three times prior to my eyes going bad. So prior to the age of 14, I only struck out three times. So I was very, I, I, was, a, I was one of the better players in Marietta. Of course there were other great players. but. I had a moniker, I had a nickname. If you had, would have come to one of my baseball games, then you would have heard, now up to bat, Dwayne Sambo Reed. Yes. We're talking about the late 70s, early 80s. I come up to the plate, Dwayne Sambo Reed. Home run by Dwayne Sambo Reed. Thrown out at second base by Dwayne Sambo Reed. I would hear this and I used to wonder why my grandfather was so angry every time it would be said. Because I was a favorite of the Perry Parm family, I was always allowed to go into the concessions and sit up on the freezer and eat as much food as I want. They feed me, they give me free stuff. My brothers and sisters, they would tell me to go in there and get some free stuff. You know, they're gonna give it to you free because they love you. They love you. Nothing against white people, but these white people love you. And I would do it and I thought it was a privilege. It was an honor. It was amazing. Every year, first pick, I was always a first pick for every team. Kenny? Always wanted me on his team. First pick, Dwayne Sambo Reed had trophies. Dwayne Sambo Reed. Didn't understand why my grandfather was so mad when I was nine years old. I mean, well, eight, getting ready to turn nine. And I remember it was my first time playing on this one field. First time up the bat. Pow, home run, first bat. Dwayne Sambo Reed with the home run, pulling in two additional runs. And as I came around, I just saw my grandfather just boiling over. And when I asked, he said, I said, why are you so upset, Granddad? He's like, why in the hell you let them call you that? 
I had no idea. That moment I had no idea who Sambo was. I don't know why my family members allowed it. I don't know why the coaching allowed it. I don't know why the black community allowed it. It was the early, it was the late 70s. Maybe it was too, still too close to segregation. I have no idea in Georgia. I don't know. I never asked that question. But what I did do is that began my journey into the library. I went to the Marietta City Library that summer and I asked the librarian, where does the idea, where does the name Sambo come from? And she pointed me to a book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So I sat down and I began to read Uncle Tom's Cabin. And as I was reading it, I was understanding some of it, but a lot of it I wasn't understanding. I was understanding more the literal thing, the basic thing. But then there was a homeless gentleman who, uh, who was always there. And he saw me coming in every day to pick up this book and read it, pick up this book and read it. I couldn't check it out. At the time, I didn't have a library card. I couldn't check it out. So he saw me coming there to read it. And then one day he asked, he said, why are you reading this book? And I said, I want to discover who Sambo is because that's what I'm called at the baseball park. And he was looked at me and he was like, no, you should never be called that. So he began to help me. He would give me historical references. He would give me, he gave me the understanding of what the condition and culture was at that time frame and why the, and, and the difference between who Sambo and Uncle Tom was. So as I'm reading this book, I began to be a little bit confused. You see, I was always taught that Uncle Tom was a horrible person, a person who was a traitor to the black community. I did not realize that Josiah Henson, whom the story is based off of, off of, is actually a hero as he's portrayed as Uncle Tom. But as I dug deeper, I realized something that most people would. Now, before I do that, I want to give you guys a little bit of history on it. So Uncle Tom's Cabin was written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This little lady who was an abolitionist, she abolitionist, <laughs> she was an abolitionist, she hated the idea of slavery and this little white lady wanted to do her part, I would assume. So she met a gentleman that she heard of up in Canada named Josiah Henson. And when she met Josiah Henson, she wanted to write his story. She wanted to tell his story in a fictional story, in a fictional book based on his life. So I forgot what you call those, but it's based on a true story. So she wanted to write this story, and she did. And in interviewing him and learning about him, she learned that Josiah Henson, when he was born, he was a sickly, weakly little dude, and he was sold for next to nothing with his mother to a gentleman named Isaac Riley. Isaac Riley, over time, saw that Josiah had potential and allowed him and made him his supervisor over the other slaves. Now here's the thing, as a supervisor, Josiah Henson, Uncle Tom, refused to hit women. He refused to beat slaves, if at all possible. At night, if he saw that certain slaves didn't fill their basket with enough cotton and he knew that they would get beat, he would fill the bags for them to ensure that they did not receive a beating. He also, Josiah Henson, he also, and Josiah Henson, and this is what Josiah Henson was doing, which is also what Uncle Tom was doing in the book in the narrative. And he would also allow, he helped other slaves to be free, to get away. He never ratted on any slaves. He ensured that they got into their freedom, that they got freedom. This is what, Jos this is what Josiah Henson and Uncle Tom was doing in the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So every time we refer to somebody as Uncle Tom, I think you're getting it wrong. You may need to reassess your statements, your thought process on it. Because Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom's Cabin, if you've never read the book, then you certainly need to stop using the terminology until you read the book so that you have an understanding of it. But it taught me that people don't read. That I go to church and they don't read. I go to school and people don't read. People just accept whatever other people say. So as I read this book for myself and I came to an understanding, of course, of course, there is the character in the book, Sambo. Sambo was the one who would tell Massa where the slaves is hiding out. He's the one who would tell Massa on the slaves who didn't pick that kind. The slave who planned on leaving. He would tell Massa and, and try to hide Massa's goal. And remember, this is a very important part. When they, when, the, when, when they came to take the slaves, when they came to take his land, then Sambo was the one who said, we, we gotta hide our gold, Massa. We gotta hide our silver, Massa. We gotta hide our property. 
our, our, the slave, saying our. This is Malcolm X's statement on, we got a good, good house here, boss. What's the matter, boss? We sick? This is the house, Negro. This is Sambo. This is what it's based off of. So in reading and understanding that character at nine years old, when I started playing football and they wanted to call me that same moniker, I demanded that I not be called that. When baseball season came back around, I demanded. I told them I will leave Perry Palm Park and I will go play at a different park and play for a different coach if you don't take that moniker off. I was nine, standing up for myself, realizing that I gotta watch out for myself and my understanding and my education, my thought process, that it can't be because of somebody else's. So I decided that because I read and I came to an understanding. But then the gentleman and the, the homeless gentleman taught me something else that I don't know if he intended to teach me or not. But he taught me about how authors take, um, they, they, they expand the story. They, they talk a little more than was, I forgot what it's called, um, literary something. But they took it. I know some, somebody in the comments is going to tell me. So tell me in the comments what that word is. Um, a literary license or storytelling license, whatever you want to call it. But they took a little liberties on this, on the story. Right? As, and as I saw the two characters, Uncle Tom and Josiah and um, Sambo, I saw the two distinct personalities. One loves his master more than he loves himself. One loves his people, but tries to work within the system to gain freedom and a better life for his people, try to save his people as much as he possibly can within the system that they're in. Until they finally get to a point where they begin to just go against the system and send people off to their freedom. This is what Uncle Tom was doing. So if somebody wanted to call me an Uncle Tom, I don't mind. You can call me that all day. You can, it's a badge of honor to call me the Uncle Tom part. Now, one of the things that we like to do is we like to make our heroes untouchable. Make our heroes as if they are the ones, they are so pristine and that they've always had this same moral barometer as, as from birth to death. So when we look at the real story of Josiah Henson, I have to say this. Josiah Henson is Uncle Tom, but Josiah Henson was also Sambo. Now, before you get mad at me and write that in the comments, hear this part out and then write in the comments what you think about it. In the story of Josiah Henson, as I told you, he was born sickly, became a supervisor. In this story, he also became a preacher of the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Now, as a preacher, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was used as a preacher to keep the people in line, keep the slaves in line, teach the slaves what the slaves need to do. Slaves be good to your masters, whether they are good or bad. You know, teach them that. Teach them to be good slaves, which is straight out the Bible. Go look it up for yourself if you disagree. And don't try to change and say the word servant or indentured servitude. That one, that's when Hebrews take Hebrews as slaves. They must free them in seven years. So let's go ahead and get rid of that argument. It says in the Old Testament that you can take slaves of, the, of your of foreigners and pass them down for generation to generation, i.e. chattel slavery. So, and it says you can beat them as long as you don't kill them. And that law was in American law as well. So do your research before you claim that that's not in the Bible. But Josiah Henson was working for um, Isaac Rodney, was a slave to Isaac Rodney. At one point, Isaac Rodney's land was going was bankrupt and he was going to have his slaves seized. But in order to prevent that, he wanted to hide his slaves. And he, he was in, I think he was in West Virginia, he wanted, in West Virginia, he wanted to hide his slaves. So he had Josiah Henson take the slaves to Kentucky. Well, in that journey, they passed through Ohio. And in the 1850s, as you pass through, Ohio was a free state. If a slave, if a black person was in Ohio, you are considered free. Regardless of what paperwork people have from another state, you were free. Ohio didn't honor slave paperwork, slave documents. You were free. They did, well, other than your emancipation papers. So, as they was traveling through Ohio, and Josiah was preaching during that time frame in Ohio to make money as they passed through, he was preaching and making money. I'm pausing dramatically, but he was preaching and making money. 
Now, as he had a plan, though, for the money, and I'll get to the plan in a minute. But he had a dilemma, a moral dilemma. <clears throat> the moral dilemma was this. I'm in a free state. Technically, I'm free. Technically, all the slaves are with me are free. But morally and based on the Bible, these slaves belong to Isaac Riley. Morally, they are his property. And the Bible tells you that you cannot envy or steal another man's property. So because of that moral dilemma, he did not free them while they were in Ohio and proceeded to take them back into the slavery of Kentucky and where they remained slaves, him and his family and all these other slaves remained slaves because he took them to Kentucky. He could not, uh, he could not unwind these teachings that you were a slave. He was born into slavery. It was all he's ever known. He was given a book that says that he should be a slave because he's black and because he's a foreigner and it should be chattel and it can be beaten and it was property so you cannot steal nor envy. So he was brainwashed into that, Josiah Henson. So in that way, when Sambo said, let's hide our silver and gold, Josiah Henson said, yes, master, I hide our slaves in Kentucky, our silver and gold. So Josiah Henson is both Sambo and Uncle Tom. The difference happens, even though it's one character, one person who was split into two characters to show the dichotomy that was going on, the duality that's going on within the one person. And you all suffer. From, we all deal with this, not suffer. We all deal with this. We deal with different personalities. One side that says do right, one side that says do wrong. One side says what is right, even though the society may say is wrong or what is wrong and society says is right. It's the same as in Islam, the jinn on your shoulder, the good little angel and the, and the bad little devil. You know, so for all y'all who say that and you're Christian, that comes from Islam. But anyway, um, so it took him doing that. And when, Jos and, and when Josiah returned back to Isaac Riley, he had made that money preaching. Isaac said that I'll give you freedom papers for $450. But then once he received the $450, he then tore up the freedom papers, said that he'll handle the papers. He'll deal with them himself. Don't worry about it, Josiah. I got you. But he tore those papers up and told Josiah that now he has to pay $1,000 if he wants his freedom. It was that betrayal that made Josiah Henson say to hell with these teachings of property in the Bible, I'm leaving, and he ran away. He ran away, went into Ohio, then went to Kentucky, got his family and a bunch of other slaves, and then made their way to, made their way to Canada. And this was before an underground railroad. So I still, out of the character of the book, will say, you can call me an Uncle Tom because most of y'all don't even understand who Uncle Tom was. But at nine years old, I realized that ain't nobody, nobody in hell is going to call me Sambo. So there was a difference. But as I studied, I realized that it is all one and the same person. And it is the challenges that we face. When you know something is wrong, but you've been conditioned to believe something is right, and you still act towards that right, towards you, what you believe is right. It is not until you feel a certain amount of pain, and the pain for Josiah Henson was the pain of being double-crossed by this other Christian man. At that moment, he left. At that moment, he understood that he needed the free slaves. At that moment, Josiah Henson truly embodied the character of Uncle Tom to which Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote about, to which Abraham Lincoln said when he met her, is this the little lady who caused such a big war? He credits her book because it stirred up the American people of that day to go against slavery. That slavery became a massive issue. That the true nature of what was going on in slavery was finally exposed. And being exposed, it was one of the catalysts for the Civil War. Of course, it's states rights, but it was the state right to own slaves. Over taxation. Over taxation on you wanting to do an agreement that accounts for a slave being two-fifths two of a man so that you can only get two-fifths taxation on it out of the South. How, no matter how you slice it, it was over slavery. Just different aspects of slavery, but slavery in itself. So, Uncle Tom's Cabin is a book that made me realize that people regurgitate information without ever researching it. 
And by understanding that from that book, understanding the pain that I felt by understanding who Sambo was in the book and being pissed that I was ever called that, it started my journey to say, what else? What else? You see, I wasn't hurt by a church. I wasn't hurt by any people in the church. I wasn't hurt by the doctrines of the church. I wasn't hurt by any of those things. I was hurt by people having a lack of understanding and I was falling in the same trap. And I, ref I was, so I was hurt by myself. I refused at that point to ever accept what people say at face value. Just, just because a million people believe it doesn't make it the truth. Millions of people believe that the Holocaust didn't happen. Millions of people believe that Hitler was right. Millions of people believe in all sorts of things. People believe in Islam. Does that make it right? According to your version, it might. People believe in Buddhism, Hinduism. People believe in all these different religions. religions. Does, does that make them right? Like I've said millions of times before, I can stand on the top of a mountain by my damn self screaming out my truth I only need myself to believe that. I don't need nobody else to validate. It. But what I refuse to do is allow somebody to dictate who I am in my life. To decide that. And I just accept it. So at nine, after reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, actually at eight and reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, and then having it uh, truly taught to me by a homeless man in the, in the Marietta City Library, then the Bible was on deck. And when the Bible came on deck, I found it wanting. I found it in need. I found it not because somebody tried to teach me a doctrine. I found it lacking in true morality, spiritual truth, basic truth, historical truth. I found it lacking in so many areas. It made no sense in many areas. Justifications for horrific things made no sense and was illogical as a man as a kid there were I, I could come up with a better plan so that is what started me on my journey I don't share that with many people this is the first time I'm sharing this publicly actually I've shared this with very very few people in my life that that time frame because I was mad at my family I was mad at my grandfather we later talked about it and he apologized. It's probably like the only apology I ever got from that man because he was a hard man, loving the, loving the life, even though he's passed on from this existence. Um, but I love my grandfather, but I did, not, I did not like him that day. That day, and for a while, I did not like him. I didn't like anybody in my family because I couldn't understand why they would allow this. At nine, eight, nine years old, I couldn't understand that. But it is good because it began me on a journey, a journey of, of true self-discovery. A journey of seeking out knowledge and seeking wisdom. You see, I can gain all the knowledge I choose, but unless I put it into action, it does not become wisdom. So I seek out wisdom by putting that knowledge to action. And that's what you must do is put your knowledge to action. Stop doing like Portia Fox did and regurgitate a term and you don't even really understand nor know the meaning of the term. Because to those who are truly illuminated, it makes you look ignorant. It makes you look like somebody who truly does not understand. And I don't give quarter to anybody for, oh, well, you know, some, that, sometimes you just skew, but you know what they mean. No, I don't know what you mean. I know what you said. I don't have time to guess your thoughts. If you speak something into the vibrational pattern, then I'm going to accept what you spoke. And that's the frequency you're on. So when she said that, and when other people of so-called leadership, power, academia say that, it truly shows their level of intelligence of self. Not intelligence of books. Intelligence of self because you just accepted it. You just accepted it. Just like many of you had just accept whatever religious book you read. And you haven't even truly studied it. Your book tells you to study to show yourself approved, but you've never read beyond your book. Nor have you truly studied your book. Studied it with an open eye. With an open eye. Let your single eye be clear. Study it with an open eye. To say that some of these things are insane if your daughter is raped and the rapist pays the father 50 shekels of silver the daughter has to marry him what god would do that or is that man saying that we need to keep our villages and our our communities tight 
That makes no sense. No God would do that. No true good one. Why would a good God make the rape victim marry the rapist? A rape victim marry and then have to produce children for the rapist because the value of women was so low to man that they had to allow all kinds of disrespectful, dishonorable things to happen to women. And you support that, you'll justify that. Then you'll say that we're, we're under grace and we're not under the law. I came not to take one tittle from the Old Testament is what it says. So that means everything in the old still applies. It still applies. All those rules. Don't lay on the bed with a woman with a period because she is now unclean. Have you ever noticed how the woman always catch hell? But who's mostly in there? Women. They don't like you. They really don't like you. They use you. And you should wake up to that point. They were using me. By calling me Sambo, they used me and was blatantly disrespectful. They were using me and they're using you. And if you're sitting up there clapping and stomping and giving your money, they're using you. You gotta look in your inner divinity. You got to look inside and find your worth and your value and say that I refuse to allow something food to just be put in front of me because I don't know the poison in it or not. I don't know if they, they, they ground it up some, some cranberry pits and took the arsenic out of it and put it in my coffee so that I can walk along in the sunshine and think that everything's wonderful and all of a sudden find myself looking up at the sky dying because they poisoned me over time. If I was in the attic, poisoned and killed over time. As you sit there, they're poisoning and killing you over time. Study and show yourself approved. Study it with an open eye. Look for your inner divinity. Realize that all things work on universal principles. For every cause, there is an effect. And for every effect, there is a cause. That as above, so below. And as we vibrate higher, we move along the polarity scale understand these truths that in order to bring order and greatness to your life you have to bring order out of the chaos you have to order your life in every aspect of your life in order to come out of the darkness and into the light so i hope this has opened up some of you guys eyes allowed you to see that there is something going on that you've been told and you haven't really come to a true understanding of but now it's time for you to Pull the thorns out of your eye. Pull that plank out of your eye. So, yeah, I'm quoting from it. It still has good wisdom. There's good wisdom in it. I quote from the Bhagavad Gita. I, I quote from the Tao. I quote from anything that has good wisdom. Because all wisdom is good wisdom. There's nothing new under the sun. So y'all have a great day. And remember, you have to free yourself to be yourself. Because your greatness is non-negotiable. Hit that subscribe button. Come on over to Patreon.